Hi, and welcome to lecture two. In this lecture, I'm going to introduce the basics of Bayesian hypothesis testing as an alternative to our traditional frequentist testing that we have already talked about. So to motivate the things that we want to talk about in this short video, I'd like to just have a, a hypothetical example. So let's start with that. Suppose we are interested in assessing the effectiveness of some mathematics instruction program. After implementing the program, we measure mathematical ability using the scale for advancing mathematical ability, or the SAMA. And I'll just tell you right now, this is a fictional scale, but let's just suppose it's a national assessment with a known mean score of 50. Okay, So that's the norms for this test. Now, we had a sample who did some training, uh, hopefully to make them better, and we found out that they had a mean of 54.4 and a standard deviation of 10. So after seeing that data, I want to know, did the training work? How do we answer that question? Now, of course, we know the answer to how to begin thinking about this question uh, because we have a basic statistical framework within which we do things. And it works as follows. This is just some review for us. First, we define two competing models, we sometimes call them hypotheses, that could possibly have generated these observed data. We have one model where the training worked, we call that the alternative hypothesis, and we have one model where it didn't work, we call that the null hypothesis. And then what we want to do is assess the fit of these models against the observed data, which is the better predictor of the data we observe. And we use that uh, result to then make a conclusion about the effectiveness of this training program. So how do we proceed? Well, I want to actually show you two possible paths that we could take. The first path will be very familiar to you. But let's start by defining our hypotheses. So what we're going to do today is we're going to define hypotheses about the effect size, delta. That little Greek letter there, delta, is one that we'll use a lot when we're talking about Bayesian hypothesis testing. More on that in a little while. The uh, two hypotheses then would be the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. The uh, null hypothesis would be that the effect is zero, that is there's no difference between the training group and the general population. And then the alternative hypothesis, that's the model where the training did work, then there's a positive effect under that model. So which one's better? Well, we need to collect some data, so we do that. In fact, we've already done that for our example. So what do we do with that data? Well, the first thing we do with these data is that we, uh, we could do this. We could compute the probability of observing those data under the null hypothesis. If the null is true, what is the likelihood that we would have observed these data? That should be familiar to you as the p-value. This is something that we have done already this semester. And the way we interpret those p-values is as follows. If p is a small number, so sometimes we use 0.05 as a threshold for this, then we say those data are rare under the null, and so we reject the null in favor of the alternative. So you know this game. This is what we call, let me get the pen going here, this is what we call frequentist hypothesis testing. And the use of p-values particularly means that this is what's called Fisher or Fisherian frequentist testing. Okay, it's a little different from Nyman Pearson, but that's a different, different lecture for a different day. So that's one path. Well, you can see there's some space on my screen. I might have another path up my sleeve. And here's the other path. Instead of computing the p-value that we saw over here, let's compute something that looks like a p-value, but also includes some information about H1. So we're going to compute this thing called BF01, which is the probability of the data under the null divided by the probability of the data under the alternative. So this is a rel it's almost like a relative p-value, if you will. I'm being very loose with the language because it is absolutely not a p-value, but uh, you can think of it like that. This happens to have a nice name. This is called a Bayes factor because it's one of the things that comes from Bayesian inference. And how we interpret it is this. If BF01 is bigger than 1, right, this is a fraction, so that means that the numerator would be the bigger number, this would tell you that the data are more likely under the null. On the other hand, if BF01 is less than 1, that tells you the denominator is the bigger number, meaning that the data are more likely under H1. 
Now, this is kind of nice. I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but you'll notice there's immediately some advantages that can come from this approach because this thing on the left-hand side that we're seeing also assesses the fit of H1. That doesn't happen over here. This just makes a decision based on the null and the null alone. Okay. So, of course, as you probably already know, this is what we call the Bayesian approach. So that's what we're going to learn about today, is the Bayesian approach. How do you do Bayesian hypothesis testing? But before we get into that, let's really list out some of the differences that we can see about p-values versus Bayes factors. Now, first of all, just to recall the definition, the p-value is the probability of the data, or more extreme, under the null. As we just mentioned, uh, this only considers the fit of the null as a potential model for the data. It does not assess the fit of H1. And because it does not assess the fit of H1, that means that the support or, quote, evidence for H1 is never direct. It's only ever indirect. That seems like a limitation to me, but I digress. Let's look, on the other hand, at the Bayes factor. So let's recall the definition of the Bayes factor. It's a relative likelihood. It considers the relative adequacy of both models as predictors of data. Whereas the p-value only looks at the null, the Bayes factor looks at both the null and the alternative as potential predictors of H1, uh, of the data. And thus, this allows us to directly index support for either model, either H0 or H1. That's really cool because frequentist inference, you can't get evidence for H0. You can only ever reject it. So it only works one way, and when it doesn't work, it just doesn't work for anything. Whereas with Bayes factors and using Bayesian inference, I can directly index support for either. It's kind of nice. In fact, what does that look like? Here's an example. Uh, let's suppose that we had a BF10 of 9. So what that would mean is that the observed data are nine times more likely under H1 than under H0. So that's kind of cool. Not only the fact that that is that bigger than one, which means that the H1 model is more preferred, but it also tells you how much more preferred. It is nine times more likely under H1 than H0. Now, just as easily, we could have gotten BF01 equals 9. Notice how the uh, difference in the subscripts here tells you the uh, direction of the evidence. So in this case, we would say the observed data are 9 times more likely under H0 than H1. So really, all that's left to figure out is how do you compute this magical thing? How do you get the base factor? Well, I'm going to show you that next. Uh, but before we do that, let's talk a little bit about interpreting Bayes factors. There's two primary ways that we can interpret the base factor. We've already mentioned one of them, and that is known as relative predictive adequacy. It's actually one of the most common ways of uh, interpreting base factors that you'll read in that burgeoning literature. So just to remind you, that looks like this. If you have a base factor equal 9, you would say the observed data are 9 times more likely under uh, H0 than H1 in this case. So, yes, yeah, this is like a Mad Libs, right? Whatever the base factor is, if it was 14, you would say that this is 14 times more likely. Under which model? Well, whichever one has the index first compared to the second index. So we've seen, we've seen that one. That's called relative predictive adequacy. It's a great interpretation. But there is another one. We can also view the base factor as an updating factor. And it's kind of cool. This is how this works. So let's suppose, again, that we have BF01 equals 9. The way you would interpret uh, the Bayes factor as an updating factor is this. You would say, after observing data, my prior odds for H0 over H1 have been increased by a factor of 9. Okay. Now, why would that be helpful? Well, here's why it's helpful. Let's just take an example where we can visualize this notion of prior odds. So let's say that before collecting data, we have nothing to tell us which is more likely as the better model, H0 or H1. This is a common default position that we might take. So in that case, we would say that the probability that H0 is the correct model is one half, and the probability that H1 is the correct model is one half. They're both equally likely. We summarize that by saying they have equal prior odds, or one-to-one -one prior odds. Okay? Now, the thing is, this is what we see before collecting data. After we collect the data, we get this base factor, and let's say it's 9. Well, what that base factor is going to do 
is it's going to now update or multiply your prior odds by nine. So whereas the prior odds were one to one, the BF uh, equals nine is gonna make those posterior odds, as they're called, nine to one. Okay, and that's what this would look like. This would now give you posterior odds of nine to one, meaning that the, prob the posterior probability of your uh, null hypothesis, that is the probability of your null after seeing data, is nine out of 10 or 90%. Whereas for um, the alternative, it's only 10%. So this is kind of a nice way. Not only can we interpret base factors in terms of this relative predictive fit, but we can also talk about it in terms of the extent to which it updates my belief in the model. After seeing data, I have a much greater belief that H0 is the correct model compared to H1. Okay. So we're going to use both of these in our example, and we'll, I'll show you how to write them up. So let's continue this example. So recall that we tested, let's say, 65 participants. Again, I'm making this number up, but it's just to have something to work with. Let's say we tested 65 participants and we observed a sample mean of 54.4 and a standard deviation sigma hat of 10. So step one is we need to convert these observed data into some test statistic. Now at this point in the semester, we've been talking about t-tests, so that makes sense for us to do that here. We're gonna convert our observed data to a t-score, which we do using the formula that you're familiar with, x bar minus mu over sigma hat over root n. We'll put in the relative numbers, we'll do the relative arithmetic, and we get a t-score of 3.55. Okay, so pretty big t-score. Step two, that's the fun one. Step two, we're gonna convert that t-score into a Bayes factor. So in the last lecture, we would have put this into a calculator to tell us the probability of getting that t-score or bigger under the null. Now we're going to put it into a slightly different calculator that instead of giving us a p-value is going to give us a Bayes factor and some more. And what is that calculator? Well, there's a link in the description below. There's also a link on the Canvas page and it's the same shiny apps website that I use, the calculator itself, is called Bayes Factor Calc, where the F and the C are capitalized. Let's go there now. So I'm gonna pop over to a browser where I've got the Bayes Factor Calculator opened up. So this looks a lot like our uh, p-value calculator from the last lecture. So over on the left are some things that we can put in about the uh, data. We can talk about design, we can talk about direction, we can put in the t-statistic, the sample size, all kinds of things. Well, let's see what we got. This is a single sample design, so we'll leave that checked. Uh, predicted direction was that we would have a positive effect. That's because our um, H1 was defined as the delta bigger than zero. Okay. In fact, you can see up here it automatically updates my model definitions so that I can make sure I've got the correct ones. The T statistic, that's the thing that we just figured out. That was 3.55. And the sample size was 65. Okay. And so doing that, um, hang on one second, let me just check something here. Sorry for the pause, one second, just wanna make sure I've got things going right. Yeah, all looks good. Okay, let me go back to what I was doing. So you can see once I put those things in, a lot of things change over here. So first of all, uh, the first thing we see change is this diagram here. This is that pizza plot that we were just looking at a little bit ago. This shows us a little bit about the predictive adequacy. This says that the data are much more likely under H1 than they are H0. How much more likely? Well, the Bayes factor for H1 over H0 is almost 70, it's 69.4. And here's an interpretation for you. This means that the observed data are approximately this many times, 69.37 times more likely under H1 than under H0. And in fact, it goes and tells us even more. This tells us the posterior probability for each of these models. Uh, posterior probability of H1 is 98.58%. Uh, that's a very high posterior probability. In other words, we're very, uh, I'm pretty darn convinced uh, that these data indicate that H1 is the best model here. So that's awesome, man. We get that all from the uh, from the calculator. I will show you real quick, you can do this exact same thing in JASP, but you won't get quite the same output. In JASP, uh, you have to go over here to the little plus menu and add something called the Summary Statistics Module. So you do that. 
Then you go up here to summary statistics and you can put in the uh, test that you did. We did a one sample t-test. The t-score we got was 3.55 and the group size was 65 and alternative was greater and there's our base factor right there. What it doesn't give us is all of the interpretation. It also doesn't give us that pizza plot. It does give us some other things and we can do some more technical things under the hood. So there are some advantages to the JASP output, but when we're first doing this, I really uh, quite frankly recommend this for a first base factor calculator. And the JASP will do things much more sophisticated for us a little bit down the road. So I'm going to go back to our notes and we're going to take all of this information that we got from the calculator and write it down. So we're going to talk about how to report this work. So the elements to report, I've got them highlighted here. The first thing that we need to do is th you know, think about writing this up in a paper. You first need to explicitly define your H0 and your H1. And in class, I'll give you a couple of uh, papers that I've written recently where we do this, just so you can see how this is done. So here's one way you might do it. This is your Bayesian inference Mad Libs. Under the null hypothesis, we expect an effect size of zero. Thus, we define H0 to be delta equals zero. Under the alternative, we expect a positive effect. That is, H1 is defined as delta bigger than zero. That's, that's how we defined it. So that's a good way to say that. So now that the reader knows what the models are, let's figure out which is the best model. So to do that, we will report and interpret the Bayes factor. So we're gonna do that predictive adequacy interpretation here. We found a Bayes factor of this, BF10 equals 69.4, which means that the observed data are approximately 70 times more likely under H1 than H0. Uh, I just, it's really close to 70, so I'm just, I just wrote it as a 70. You could just say they're 69.4 times more likely. It doesn't matter. Uh, if you want to round, that's fine. But the point is, we use that predictive adequacy interpretation here. Then I want to report the updating part, the, this posterior model probability. So I would say something like this. Assuming prior odds of 1 to 1 for H1 and H0, our observed data updated these odds to 69.4 to 1 in favor of H1, right? That's because the Bayes factor is the extent to which those prior odds get multiplied. And if you convert 69.4 to 1 into a probability, you get a posterior probability of this, okay? So that was, again, this number came directly from the app, which was kind of nice. Uh, you don't get that directly in JASP. Uh, you would have to compute it by hand. I can show you how to do that in a, in a uh, problem session sometime. And that's it for that. The last thing that I might mention before ending this lecture is what about statistical significance? At this point in your career, you've probably been taught to say things about statistical significance. Do you need to do that here? And the answer is no. We usually don't use this phrase in a Bayesian context. It's the, I think the reason for that is not because the word significant is bad, but because it's been used so much as part of the frequentist paradigm that it really becomes easy to mix things up. And so I don't recommend using it at all. Uh, what I would recommend instead is that we speak of model evidence from the data. Make it a Bayesian concept that you are talking about here. Let's see what I mean by that. Um, first of all, we need uh, some idea of how much evidence is enough. The classic sort of benchmark for evidence comes from Jeffries in 1961. He recommended these ranges. If you have a Bayes factor between 1 and 3, that's, that's pretty much anecdotal evidence. Uh, 3 to 10, we, he calls moderate, 10 to 30 is strong, and it goes up from there. Uh, you, get in, you get above 10, you, you got good, strong evidence for, for these models. So let's use uh, these, uh, these guidelines. I do mention these are only guidelines. They're not hard and fast. So uh, what might we say here? We might say something like this. In summary, these data provide very strong evidence in favor of H1. That's because our base factor was in there, right? Uh, that is, the training program had a positive effect on math performance. Okay, So I didn't use the word significant in there anywhere, and I didn't need to. I think that's the fun part of this, is writing up results in a way that does not use the phrases that we all grew up with. So that's that, guys. Um, just I'm going to go back to that flowchart real quickly. I think this right here is a good way to keep these straight.
the Bayes factor is much more powerful and I think is a better diagnostic criterion than the p-value. Uh, I am a Bayesian, so of course I think that. In fact, uh, this is one of the reasons I am a Bayesian. Uh, I, th I would recommend you have good knowledge of both, and in this course we will talk about both both approaches throughout the semester. Whatever you use, it's just important that you use it correctly. So that's all for now. We will uh, come back next time and start doing some specific designs, doing both frequentist analyses as well as Bayesian analyses. And then the first one will probably be the uh, single factor ANOVA, and then we'll move on from there. So that's all for now, and I will see you guys next time.